Good morning. Hi, David Willits here, Chair of the Foundation for Science and Technology. I'm speaking slowly just so that we can give time for our participants to join us. I can see the, the numbers rising for our discussion on scenarios for a science superpower uh, online on Zoom and uh, with some really uh, interesting contributors joining us. So uh, we've, uh, as you know, for the government, uh, becoming a science superpower is a high priority. We want to try to understand what that means and what the policy options are for delivering it. Uh, welcome to this FST event. We're going to hear first from Professor Graham Reed and Professor Sarah Main, uh, a double act. I think Sarah's going to open up who are, have been carefully thinking on what the different scenarios are for a science superpower. We'll then hear from Lisa Brody, science counselor at the US Embassy in London, uh, who's worked in the US Foreign Service since 1994. Uh, and then we'll hear from Professor Lord Martin Rees, uh, who is uh, a colleague and friend in the House of Lords, uh, sitting on the Science and Technology Committee, um, and previously, of course, President of the Royal Society and also Master of Trinity College, Cambridge. And I may even find myself moved to make some observations of my own, especially as sadly Chianura MP, who we'd hope would be able to join us, has not been uh, able to. So, uh, and, me, and if you have uh, any comments or questions, do use the Q&A function. We're not with Slido today. It's use the classic Q&A function on Zoom, please, not chat Q&A. So first, Sarah, thank you to you and Graham for, for setting the ball rolling. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, David. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and thank you to the Foundation for hosting the webinar today um, and to organisations that have supported the work that Graham and I have been doing over recent months. And they are the British Academy, the School of Advanced Study at the University of London and the Wales Innovation Network. Our intention in the work we've been doing has been to stimulate discussion and gather a wide range of views so today's webinar is particularly valuable uh, and we would really encourage all of you uh, in the audience to share your views in the Q&A. The government's ambition for the UK to become a science superpower has been widely welcomed, as David said. Graham and I want to explore the choices facing policymakers on that journey. So our question is not if we can get there, but assuming we will get there, what different versions of a UK science superpower are available? Which do we want? What do we value about each of them? And so what choices face policymakers that could determine the destination at which we arrive? In my view, there is an enormous opportunity at hand. And if we can examine these choices and move purposefully towards an end goal we want, I believe we can harness the political will and the investment commitments that have already been made to deliver a more innovative R&D-led UK economy and culture with the widest possible benefit to all. The science superpower phrase has been used for some time and by politicians across uh, the top of government for a number of years now. We have a couple of examples here. Firstly, we see the Prime Minister associating the science superpower phrase with his levelling up agenda back in 2021. And in this example, the then Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, associating the science superpower agenda with fiscal incentives such as R&D tax credits. And this was at the spending review of last autumn. And finally, earlier this year, the government chief scientific advisor, Patrick Balance, wrote in a blog about the global super science superpower associating uh, that ambition with strategic policy making and strategic advantage. Over the last few months, Graham and I have been conducting roundtables and interviews with stakeholders across the R&D community and across the whole of the UK. And we have really tried to widen our discussions 
so that they reached broadly across all of uh, academia, across different disciplines in um, policy expertise, science, humanities, uh, and so on, into business, into government and various uh, parts of government with an interest in R&D, uh, including defense, the business department, um, and the government office for science, it, it, through funding bodies, think tanks, uh, through uh, our colleagues in international diplomacy, and many more. As you might expect, we've heard a wide range of reactions to the phrase science superpower. And I'm sure all of you in the audience have your own views on what it means to you. We've gathered together some categories, some types of responses that we heard several times. Um, and I've summarized them here for you now. It may not come as a surprise in a community which really highly values definition of terms that some of the first and, and most frequent reactions were about its definition. So many respondents have said to us, well, I don't know what it means. Um, but some have said, I don't know what it means, but it sounds exciting. And I think it's something I want to be part of. Others have said, I don't know what it means. And I'm concerned about its overtones or its meaning. Some of those um, questions around definition have related to the term science. What is included in that phrase? Does it include home humanities, arts, social sciences? Does it include engineering and innovation? Some concerns have been around the term superpower. Many have felt that it is not as inclusive as they would like it to be, um, that it perhaps has some historic throwback overtones um, that people have, have observed may make them, them feel uncomfortable or may be uncomfortable in international relations. Some have observed that being a science superpower is not something one can um, attribute to oneself. It's actually a, a, a recognition that others give to you so that we will only, the UK will only be a science superpower when others uh, say that we are such. But a good number have really recognized it as a political slogan and recognize that it has one wide support. Graham and I have done some work to uh, review the kind of uh, support that that phrase has gathered from external sources. And here we share some of the um, quotes that we found in, in broadsheet newspapers and online, where we see some large corporates uh, reflecting and aligning with the science superpower ambition, um, often with intimation that it may lead to further investment on their part. So for example, in this quote by Legal and General in the Financial Times. So we can at least say that the science superpower phrase is one that signals both internally into the R&D community and signals externally. And it may, uh, entice different reactions in, in the communities that, that it reaches. So in order to explore different versions of a UK science superpower, Graham and I first thought about where we are now, where is UK research and innovation um, system at the moment? And of course, there are many important and different ways in which one could measure and assess this. Um, we will think and talk about the economic goals, the investment goals, um, but of course one can talk about um, the goals around education and skills, uh, the workforce for science, educational uptake and attainment, geographic distribution of R&D, international comparisons, and of course many more. But just focusing for a moment on the economic metric, uh, we know that the proportion of the economy attributed to R&D at the moment is around about 1.7, 1.8%. And we know that it has been at approximately that level for some decades now. And one of the elements of the science superpower ambition is the economic goal to really rapidly increase that proportion of the economy attributed to R&D to 2.4% and beyond. Graham and I have thought about three scenarios in which we might achieve that science superpower status. They're not mutually exclusive, 
and they can be thought of as points in a continuum. And we've designed them to be contrasting and to be tools for, to help us stimulate debate. And I'm going to hand over now to Graham to talk a little bit more about those scenarios and our exploration of those with our stakeholders. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, and uh, here we have on the slide three, I suppose, three caricatures of the future, each one a, a, a simplified version of how the science superpower uh, uh, agenda might evolve. Uh, so one of these imagines that the research and innovation system in this country will maintain its current shape and everything in it will expand equally uh, over the coming years, cementing in the strengths and weaknesses of the existing system. Another scenario imagines that public spending on research and innovation will remain pretty well intact as it stands now, but we will experience a very large expansion in business investment in R&D. And our third scenario has the expansion in R&D driven very largely by the government's own priorities in areas like public health, climate change, and defence and security. As you might imagine, each of these gives rise to a number of opportunities and challenges. And in the next few minutes, I'll catalogue a few of the opportunities and challenges that we identified and say a bit more about a couple of them. Uh, so under equal expansion, uh, we had we had rather imagined that this would not be an attractive option. Uh, at some workshops, Sarah described this as our null hypothesis. But we were quite surprised to find that in several parts of the country, this scenario was a, an attractive option because it provided predictability in an uncertain world and offered a degree of protection to parts of the research and innovation community that found the idea of radical expansion of research and innovation uh, rather unsettling or, or even threatening. The idea of a massive expansion in business investment in R&D has been attractive to finance ministers around the world and not least in the UK, the, the Treasury have, have built this in rightly to their ambitions to expand research investment in the UK. Uh, there are many attractive features of an expanded business investment in R&D, but it does mark a shift in the balance of influence with uh, more, uh, more influence falling to the marketplace than we have at the moment. Uh, one, one feature that arose in, in our discussions was that if you do have a free market in business R&D, in that case, businesses may well choose to expand their R&D in locations that uh, are at odds with other areas of government policy. So what if we saw a doubling of business R&D investment, but that all fell in the southeast of England, uh, exacerbating regional divides rather than levelling them up? In a world where government priorities play a much larger part in the, the research and innovation landscape, a question arises as to which government. We've got progressively greater levels of devolution at national and regional levels in the UK. The Scottish government takes a different view on nuclear power and a different view on genetically modified crops to the UK government. So whose government priorities are we talking about? 
these, I, I, I could go on, but I think it's more important that I shift now to thinking about some of the choices that are available to the research and innovation community and indeed to government uh, as a result of these different scenarios. You can imagine many choices. I've shown a few and I've highlighted fewer still. But the point I'd like to make is that all of these choices uh, are connected to a shift in the balance of influence between government researchers themselves and business investors. That balance has reached its current position through a long evolutionary process. And we're not used to the idea of a radical perturbation in the level of research investment, shifting that balance of influence over a relatively short time. We're not quite sure what we would want the balance to be or whether that balance would be stable in the way it's been stable now. Um, the, so that in brief summarizes the work that Sarah and I have drawn together uh, over the, the last few months. We think it's important to, to see this as a stimulus for further discussion and debate rather than some firm non-negotiable conclusions. Uh, and we hope that participants in this meeting will feel free to, to, to challenge and, and supplement the thoughts that we've drawn together so far. Um, on behalf of us both, can I thank you for your attention? Thank you very much, uh, both Sarah and Graham, for, for setting the ball rolling, well, setting the scene with your very interesting three different scenarios. We're now going to go straight to Lisa Brody, uh, who is the Environment, Science, Technology and Health Council at the US Embassy in London with a long history of engagement in science and international diplomacy and served as director of the Office for Science and Technology Cooperation in London. Lisa, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much uh, for that nice introduction. And uh, thank you also for the invitation to speak to the to the group at the Foundation uh, for Science and Technology. It, it's an honor and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, as mentioned, I have had a long career in and primarily in science diplomacy, multilateral and also bilateral science diplomacy. And um, whereas the, the previous speakers were very detail oriented about the UK, I'm going to pull back, maybe look at the other end of the telescope and speak of, of really science diplomacy um, from the U.S. perspective and the, the larger picture of, of the opportunities and responsibilities of, of being a, I, I know it's a loaded word now, as soon as you get colonialism linked with uh, super, super science power, it's, it's a bit loaded, but being a heavyweight in, in the science and research world. Um, as you know, the United States government places significant importance on scientific endeavors, and it does invest more than I believe any other country in research and development. We also recognize, however, that technical expertise, the knowledge, the resources uh, go far beyond our borders. In fact, science is a global endeavor, and you'll hear me say that a few times. International cooperation in science is as vital as, as ever. You know, as, as all of our borders, our information borders become more and more porous, science is um, it's a shared act. We collaborate with scientists all over the world on everything from high energy physics to stem cells. And we see science um, diplomacy and using science uh, globally as a way to build bridges with, with other peoples and, and communities. So international science and technology cooperation is, a, is definitely a focus for the Biden administration. It's a major pillar of how we view foreign affairs. Science and technology is a core part of our dip diplomacy planning and, and practice. Um, and I, I think it's safe to say that uh, research and science is core to our decision making. 
But as I mentioned, there, there are opportunities and responsibilities that, that come with being that science superpower. Um, it, science is a global endeavor, not only in the making of the science, but also in the fact that science has the power to mitigate global crises, pandemic, climate change. It lifts economies, which is, I think, what that, that leveling up piece is all about. And it improves people's lives throughout the world. Science diplomacy is about recognizing and facilitating the opportunities and being mindful of the responsibilities that come with being that science superpower. With that in mind, the State Department has a number of programs that aim to share our science with scientists and government partners that are, that are up and coming. So I'm going, to, I'm going to pull on my experience, having been director of, of our Office of Science and Technology Cooperation, uh, with some examples of, of how we have, have handled this. Um, one is our Science Envoys program. And, and this is where we pull some science superstars um, from the academic community and we anoint them as, as envoys. For example, um, Peter Hotez uh, was, was a science envoy, as was Jane Lubchenco, just to name two that come to mind from my past. And they, they are just that, they're volunteer envoys. We support them for a year or two so that they can go out and they can talk about their passion, their science, they can develop programs. Um, Peter Hotez spent a, a lot of time in Egypt. Others go to Vietnam, Azerbaijan. Um, and in fact, Peter Hotez uh, said, if I can quote him, becoming a US science envoy offers an incredible opportunity to explore the themes of science and vaccine diplomacy as a component of US foreign policy. So, so this is a really important way of um, uh, energizing other countries and, give, and empowering the science and the decision making in their governments by, by sharing our, our superstars with them, basically. We also have science fellow program, and these are working scientists from our government agencies, whether it's the Department of Energy, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, and they join us at embassies for six weeks or so, bringing their area of expertise with them. We had an embassy fellow from the Department of Energy who worked on quantum, um, quantum issues here in London, not just, just before COVID. And she made a lot of contacts, she deepened a lot of connections, and, and I believe that collaboration is, is still occurring. We also have exciting programs um, on science and technology, science entrepreneurs, basically, s and entrepreneurs. These are young young new researchers and scientists or, or just individuals who's, who've developed some kind of cool thing and we, we coach them, we, we find mentors for them, we have competitions and it's just a way of, of sharing some of, of our wealth in that entrepreneurship area with, with uh, in emerging economies with young scientists. I, I went to a really exciting program in Tunisia with where a young woman, the, the winner of the competition was, you know, an 18-year-old Tunisian woman who beat out a lot of more experienced men in that, in that case. Um, but of course, responsibility and, and opportunity are intertwined, and that relationship is perhaps best captured in our support of the bilateral science and technology agreements that we have, dozens of them. And these are umbrella agreements um, where we come, you know, we negotiate and come to some agreement on intellectual property rights and, and the overarching scenarios that guide our research exchanges and, and all the other details that goes into the, really, the sausage making of, of science. Um, negotiating these are, it's slow going because we don't only speak for our government scientists and agencies, but also for academics throughout. Um, for example, I, I remember negotiating with one country, you know, what happens when you get a young exchange student that goes to country X with, you know, some kernel of an idea and, and some sof significant, sophisticated technique and, and then shares it with that university scientist. It, it, something happens and then who owns that IP? So these are the kinds of things we try and hammer out beforehand. I'm sure you have much more experience with this than I do. Um, and of course, you know, we had our bout with Horizon and, and trying to figure out how our funded scientists could collaborate well with the Horizon uh, 2020 at that time funded scientists. But, you know, we managed to, to work something out. Um, and that brings in that sort of that government issue 
one of the issues of with this, or one of the advantages of the science and technology umbrellas is that we do have the opportunity then to meet with our, our bilateral partners. And oftentimes these science and research ministries, the ministries that, that cover those issues um, or fund academia are not, let's face it, the most powerful ministries in these governments. So having the US and in the, you know, the UK, I'm sure you have similar things at the table with these scientists and ministry um, folks responsible, it, it lends a lot of credibility and, and, and starts to empower that whole scientific enterprise in the minds of the ministries that will fund the, um, the science and research. So, so it, it lifts everything up. So these large, um, these, these the relationships, whether they're people to people or government to government, um, are, are important because we're caretakers of the scientific enterprise. That's, that's part of that responsibility and, and the opportunity. But our job is to ensure that we have an ethical and, and level playing field where there's common understanding on the conduct of, the, of ethical science from funding the research to reporting and, and publishing. So let me quickly pivot to the sort of global uh, 20,000 foot to something more specific, which is our relationship with the UK. Obviously, the UK is, is probably our premier partner on science and technology. Um, we, we share what I just mentioned, that belief in the power of science and technology to improve health and prosperity and security and, and a shared commitment as well um, to the importance of investigator-driven research and freedom of inquiry. Uh, for centuries, science has been the foundation of our special relationship, and, and probably that's another word <laughs> expression that's a bit overused, but it's, it's so true for, for the U.S. and the U.K. And in fact, it, it probably began with Benjamin Franklin's correspondence with the Royal Society on Electricity, but I have a feeling it, it's gone even farther back than that. The U.K. and U.S. are two research powerhouses. That's another expression one can use. Our scientists have won an impressive 358 Nobel Prizes, and between us we host all of the world's top 10 universities. Working together has produced many tangible impacts, and just recently two Americans and a British scientist won the 2020 Nobel Prize. So um, it's clear that we both value the unique, our unique expertise, partnering and, and uh, working together across geographical and disciplinary boundaries. I think um, one of the great things is, is as we take our um, enduring special relationship forward, we're better positioned than anywhere else in the world to turn that research into new technologies that can, can change the world and grow our economies. And it's for this reason that the United States and the United Kingdom agreed to update our science and technology cooperation just last year. In the New Atlantic Charter <clears throat> that came out of the G7 meeting in um, Cornwall, the U.S. and the U.K. resolved to harness and protect our innovative edge in science and technology to support our shared security and deliver jobs at home to promote the development and deployment of new standards and technologies to support democratic values and to continue to invest in research into the biggest challenges facing the world. Building off of that resolve, <coughs> excuse me, the US and the UK further agreed to develop a landmark science and technology partnership to strengthen the valued UK-US relationship and of course create those jobs. It's all about that leveling up and protecting the security, which includes obviously um, the security of knowing that the, the global challenges and crises of, that the world faces are being addressed together because anyone's crisis affects our security. That's part of being citizens in that global world. It aims to strengthen cooperation in areas such as the resilience and security of critical supply chains, battery technologies, emerging technologies, including artificial intelligence, and improve accessibility and the flow of data to support economic growth. Perhaps one of the, the strongest examples of science undergirding and forcing a direction for policy is climate science. Simply put, we would not have been able to make the achievements that we did at COP26, um, the progress on national commitments, on the methane pledge, for example, and others, if, if there had not been overwhelming consensus on the, the climate science. Scientists have warned for decades uh, that with the speed of human-related warming, extreme weather events such as heat waves and storms and wildfires, et cetera, 
um, would become more common and the world would become a more volatile and dangerous place to live. And we are certainly seeing that play out in, in spades. But if it weren't for the persistence of scientists, our activists and ultimately our politicians and citizens would not have been able to leverage the now settled science and use that science to gain some momentum in tackling the, the crisis. It, it's, it's how science persevered and really persevered until you got into the heads of the decision makers and policy makers. Um, at COP26, we saw the implementation of s and in initiatives that aid in tackling those climate um, challenges. Uh, there's uh, clean energy transitions around the world. The US launched Net Zero World to marshal the 17 US national laboratories and provide critical te technical assistance to key partner countries. In addition, the US and uh, United Arab Emirates actually led the launch for the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate, which counts 80 partners in many countries and, and billions of dollars to advance climate, smart agriculture, and food systems for innovation. So uh, to wrap it up, as, as the UK focuses on its ambitions on science domestically, the US is ready and willing to continue our long history, Benjamin Franklin, of partnership with, with all of you, not only bilaterally, but together as world leaders in using science to solve the critical challenges ahead for humans, for nature, and for the planet. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much indeed, Lisa, and uh, a very useful review of the intensifying cooperation between the US and the UK. Uh, now it's great that Martin Rees has kindly joined, to con uh, uh, joined us and agreed to contribute to our event. Martin, of course, is the Astronomer Royal, and through his role on the Science and Technology Committee on the House of Lords, I think they're currently thinking about precisely this issue. So Martin, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Over to you. Um, thank you, David. Um, of course, as you know so well, um, there are two weak links in the transition from uh, discovery in universities and the wider economy. The first is the so-called valley of death between academia and viable startups. And the second stems from the lack of venture capital in the UK, which leads to premature sellouts to the US. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about the academic end of this chain, but stimulated by the last contribution, I'd like to spend two minutes at the end on my favoured grand challenge, which is indeed uh, dealing with uh, energy and the environment. We're used to the idea that research is concentrated in universities. This is a system which uh, has prevailed in the US and the UK, but it doesn't prevail everywhere. Although the research university was invented by Humboldt in Germany, most of that nation's best researchers are now in Max Planck institutes. And in France, there are civil servants in CNRS institutions. So the kind of academic career that mixes teaching and research is really a sort of Anglo-Saxon model, although it's now been widely adopted in the Far East. Research universities benefit the economy partly through direct knowledge transfer to industry. And even though the follow through may be channeled towards a few priority challenges, Academia should surely collectively cover the whole map of learning. That's for two reasons. First, to optimize teaching, which is a very important output of the universities is of course good students. But second, to maintain a watching brief over the whole world's research, so as to seize on a new idea and run with it. UK startups need not be based on ideas that germinate here. We have more than our share of clever ideas in the world, but still 90 plus percent come from elsewhere. We ought to be in touch with them. And of course, we can't confidently predict how or when or whether a specific academic research project will pay off, still less when its applications will offer social or economic benefit. But successes are favored by a nurturing environment. And let me quote a former Royal Society president, Aaron Klug, I quote, the major insights in science come from people 
who have the patience to develop an intimate understanding of a problem, who have the space and the freedom to take professional risks, and who know how to make creative use of the surprises that they encounter when they do so. These are the people who make the enduring difference. These are the people whom we must nurture wherever we find them. And it's true that confidence and high morale are what drive creativity, innovation, and risk-taking. That's true in science, but in the arts and in entrepreneurial activity too. And researchers themselves have the best expertise and the strongest motive for judging what topics hold promise. Their careers depend on making good choices. And the difference in payoff between the very best research and the merely good is by any measure thousands of percent. So what's most crucial in giving taxpayers enhanced value for money isn't the few percent of savings that might be made by improving efficiency in the office management sense. It's maximizing the chance of the big breakthroughs by attracting top talent, backing the judgment of those with the best credentials and supporting them appropriately. And they're the people who research universities must, must attract and nurture. A perennial tension in funding bodies is between the support of people and the support of specific projects. The latter option is administratively tidier and allows the funder to demand quarterly reports of progress and keep track of steps towards a declared target. And it's sadly becoming more dominant. But history shows that it's often the free wheeling inquiry which leads to the biggest advances. And in lively research groups, it's exhilarating when coffee time conversations toss out new ideas and debate the latest discoveries. And I'm lucky to have worked in one of them. But even in this kind of privileged environment, my younger colleagues seem ever more preoccupied with grant cuts, proposal writing, job security, and such like. Prospects of breakthroughs will plummet if such concerns prey unduly on the minds of even the best young researchers. When there was an article on this theme in uh, uh, Research Fortnights, the editor gave it the title, Why I'm Glad I'm Not a Young Academic. And uh, that was not my title, but that is true. It's not just in the UK, but in the EU and the US that bodies allocate public funding based on ever more detailed performance indicators to quantify the output. This has the best of intentions, but it can impede the best professional practice. There's a danger that a focus on what can be measured and can feature in lead tables may distort policy to the detriment of longer term benefits. And because of these pressures, universities risk becoming less propitious environments for research projects that demand intense and sustained efforts. Indeed, one reason why the UK has developed special strength in biomedical sciences stems from the existence of laboratories allowing full-time, long-term research that is getting harder and harder to do in universities. The LMB and the Crick and John Innes and Rothamsted, for instance, may allow better environments. There's a downside, of course, as they reduce talented researchers in contact with students. And of course, in biomedical areas, UK government funding is massively supplemented by the Wellcome Trust, cancer charities, etc., and physical sciences aren't so lucky. But if a science superpower is to be more than just a vacuous phrase, we've surely got to ensure two things. We've got to ensure that academia attracts a share of young people with flexible talent who want to achieve something distinctive in their 30s. And that's harder. And the US is having the same problems as us in this respect. We risk academia becoming a repository for the kind of nerds who couldn't do anything else. And we need to promote percolation between the sectors. Academia is far too rigid in its promotion criteria and allowing people to enter and leave it. But of course, as earlier speakers have emphasized, to ensure effective exploitation of new discoveries, these research institutions must be complemented by organizations in the public or private sector 
which can offer adequate manufacturing capability when it's needed. And that fortunate concatenation certainly proved its worth in this country in the recent pandemic. It's imperative likewise that nations should foster expertise in energy, climate, and the cybersphere, and that research and development should be accommodated in a range of institutions of complementary strength to facilitate blue sky speculation, long-term programs, and a rapid response to emergencies. Research isn't a zero-sum game, and indeed, as the last speaker emphasized, it's international. And it would be good for the UK, for instance, were there more top tier research universities in the rest of Europe, incentivizing greater mobility and opportunity. Europe collectively could then offer a stronger counter attraction to North America and to China as a destination for mobile talent. Sadly, this has had a serious setback due to Brexit, its reality, and even more its perception. And let's remember that members in the so called big sciences. There's long been well-managed European collaboration and European consortia have achieved real excellence. CERN in Geneva is destined to remain the world's leading lab for particle physics for at least the next decade. And Europe's space program, if we consider the scientific and unmanned part, is fully a match now for what NASA does. So those are exciting prospects. And I'd just like before finishing uh, to turn from the uh, academic end of research to the priorities. And of course, we know that the government has uh, uh, sets of grand challenges, seven, six, or four, depending on which report you read. But one of them clearly is going to be um, uh, dealing with uh, climate change. And for this, real breakthroughs are needed in energy generation, storage, and smart grids. And I think there's a broader and especially compelling motivation for prioritizing these efforts in countries like the UK and the US. And it's this, under business as usual scenarios, the main rise in annual CO2 emissions will come in the next 30 years from the countries in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, which can't reach acceptable living standards without generating more power than they do today more per capita and their population is growing and will be 4 billion by mid-century. So bending the trajectory of CO2 emissions from these nations is crucial. Because if they develop like China, they'll emit 40% as much CO2 as the whole world does today by 2050. The global South must be economically and technically enabled to leapfrog to clean energy rather than building coal-fired power stations rather as they've transitioned directly to smartphones without ever building landlines. So traditionally, technically advanced countries like ours can catalyze a far greater reduction in global emissions by helping the developing world to do this leapfrogging than we can just by achieving net zero ourselves. Remember that in this country, we are only one or 2% of global emissions. And incidentally, similar arguments to those I applied to climate change apply to the challenge of providing the world's food without encroaching on the natural environment and also easing the blight of infectious diseases. Uh, so uh, those would be my priorities for long term grand challenges um, because of their economic value and because um, uh, it's hard to think of a more idealistic challenge for attracting young people into engineering. Uh, than solving these great global problems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Um, and uh, a very useful indication of some of the options there. I mean, just very briefly to add to that and, and focusing on how we get from here to 2.4%, just, um, I think there's, let me briefly enumerate, I think some of the policy issues, some of which have just been touched on by Martin. First, the balance between higher education spend and research outside higher education, a very hot topic, and Paul Nurse's landscape review is relevant for this. If you're gonna have a big growth, uh, while we've had relatively modest funding, we've had a strategy of essentially putting all our eggs in the basket of university funding, which has not been a bad strategy at all. To what extent can we look to move to a wider network? We are reminded by Lisa of America's 17 national labs. 
um, incidentally, not part of the original Vannevar Bush plan. He wanted it all to be university-based, but the departments insisted on keeping their national labs and their property right to do so. Secondly, and again, Martin rightly touched on this, if, uh, for growth, if, it's, if, the, if bureaucracy gets worse and more heavy-handed, it's going to be hard to be innovative and nimble and spend the money well. Uh, processes, both within government, and externally seem to become ever more demanding. And one solution is to try to carve out with an, a new institution like ARIA, um, an area, an institution that's supposed to be free of those. But speaking as a board member of UKRI, we'd quite like to have whatever freedoms ARIA has. And it would be great if, if there are freedoms that improve performance, they should not be restricted to ARIA. I hope across Whitehall, those lessons can be applied. Um, and particularly for public sector research establishments, which should be part of a di diverse landscape, but do labor under particularly heavy controls. Thirdly, there are various boom and bust risks. Uh, Michael Titledown has a very good book on the instability of science careers in the US in the last 30 years, heavily driven by surges, dramatic increases in spending, which do things like attracting lots of young researchers, following a period, followed by a period of retrenchment when suddenly their long-term careers languish um, and the word goes out that STEM careers aren't all they're made up to be. So there are arguments for growing steadily um, and also arguments for a degree of continuity in government policy, which we can turn to. Uh, fourth, can we do better on co-funding? The Treasury are very focused on co-funding and are very keen to see public spend leveraging private spend. Uh, the biggest single reason why the 2.4% wasn't achieved under the Labour government, which set a similar target, was that the Treasury were ludicrously over-optimistic about a tiny increase in public spend, which they hoped would yield a very large increase in private spend. Um, so we have to avoid that optimism bias, if you like. Uh, and probably the tax credit is overrated as a device for bringing in that type of collaboration. And um, I think if the Treasury were really rigorous at looking at uh, returns for spend, including tax credit spend, they may find there are des programs designed by bodies like Innovate UK that actually achieve greater leverage of private spend than you get by spending the money on, on a very unusually generous R&D tax credit regime here in the UK. That would be my fourth on my list. Um, fifth and sixth really follow on from what Lisa was saying, um, because one of the features of the growth in the UK budget at the moment is the growth particularly in defence and security related R&D. That's probably where the growth in public spend is greatest. Uh, and the challenge which the UK has not risen to successfully in the past has been to link up the security side of things and the civil side of things to get a real commercial impact. Uh, now that so much of the money is going through security agencies, we will be able to do a better job in the future of linking that to promote private spend and contribute more widely to an innovative environment for uh, increased R&D, because that's an important tool for increasing public spend, which leads on to my sixth observation. And again, this is a bit of a challenge for Lisa, really, which is um, we de definitely have a close working relationship with the US, and let's hope everybody wants to see it grow even closer. The US, with its security concerns, often attaches quite strict conditions on everything from ITAR to research partnerships with China. So sometimes there are constraints and doing stuff with the US is also a choice that you can't do it with some other countries. Um, and the US can sometimes extend quite ambitiously its interpretation of the security angle of research partnerships and hence become very restrictive. And Britain has to negotiate its way through this. Obviously, the special relationship um, matters as an and is important. Um, but uh, the most sensitive area of this at the moment is China. To what extent can, should Britain, partly for the reasons Martin was setting out, still aim to have uh, research partnerships with China in key areas? And if so, 
will those fall foul of US policy. So negotiating through that is going to be, I think, quite a tricky challenge. Uh, let's now turn to the Q&A. And I wanted to start with it with a, with a very pertinent question from Jeremy Clayton. So this is the, um, I see all our panelists are now all visible. I'm gonna put this to our panelists, which is, I think he brings out very vividly a quality quantity question. So the superpower both has a slightly sort of chauvinistic, um, one of the best in the world flavor to it. It's also got a really big flavor to it. If you look at, um, one of the clear measures on which Britain scores very highly, the field weighted citation index, um, you see that we are, have, a, have a cobweb of, very, uh, of a very large number of disciplines where our citation index is above unity, is above one. Um, and in fact, we're probably unique in being on at double that, at two for a very wide range of disciplines. Um, is there ever a, qual a trade off between quality and quantity? Is it, feasible, is it feasible to imagine our having both growing as rapidly as is implied and maintaining a field, a, a field weighted citation index as good as that? And if so, which do we care about more? Um, perhaps uh, let, let's go to Martin first. Uh, any observations on Jeremy Clayton's question um, on? quality whilst uh, ambition to being a superpower whilst maintaining quality. Well, I, I mean, uh, I just thought there's no conflict if we interpret quality in the appropriate sense. Um, but uh, if we look at these uh, uh, league tables of uh, uh, citations, etc., then of course, they're very misleading for two reasons. First, they unfairly favour um, English language uh, speaking countries. Uh, but secondly, of course, uh, we know that some countries, uh, indeed China for a time, um, hugely incentivized publishing in certain journals. Um, and, uh, and so the culture um, of um, uh, academia, which uh, um, in my view is distorting um, things very much, uh, may be promoting excessive publications in some countries and not in others. So I wouldn't attach too much weight to these citation criteria. Very interesting, thank you. Sarah or Graham, do either of you want to comment on, on Jeremy's challenge? So um, I think one of the, the, one of the features that, that Jeremy's challenge brings out is that the government's ambitions are expressed in quite short time horizons. They imagine quite a radical increase in research investment. And I think that creates a greater tension between quality and quantity than would arise if the growth was uh, taking place over a longer time period. Uh, it also highlights the competition that the UK is in with countries around the world for both the extremely talented people to which Martin refers and investment, particularly from businesses, both of whom have a choice of where to locate their money or their people. Uh, and if we are embarking on a rapid expansion, our ability to compete is different to if we were embarking on a steadier growth over a longer period. Thank you very much. Um, because we talked, I'm, I'll turn to, Greg, to Sarah on another question, just because we're all very tight for time. And Lisa, anything you want to say on that? And also perhaps my, my gentle teasing on the US constraints of who else we can work with. Well, I mean, being an American and, and hearing about quality versus quantity does immediately bring in to mind China, <laughs> you know, and, and all that supply chain stuff. Um, it also brings to mind my, my comments about what we used to call research integrity. I'm not sure what the, in the U.S., I'm not sure what the, the term of art is right now. Um, uh, all those citations are great if, if your scientific enterprise is undergirded by a common understanding of the ethical ways that research is conducted so that you don't just, you know, willy-nilly start publishing here and there these false journals and the things that we hear about. Um, in terms of security, I, uh, it brought to mind our work here with the UK, uh, sponsored by the Office of Naval Research in the UK, 
as well as UK enterprises, uh, the government, I guess, puts a certain amount in, and the US does. But there, they're doing all sorts of things on uh, by oh gosh, now I'm forgetting artificial jet fuel, things like that, which are a security issue. It's very much sponsored by the Office of Naval Research, but then it makes its way into the private sector, and that's how so much of our science is done. Um, so yes, there is, of course, the dual use kind of concerns that the U.S. has, and with China, the dual use is, is certainly, um, ex ex you know, we're very sensitive about it. But there's also all that other potential for um, taking the research that is funded by the U.S. government on security, but then makes its way into the private sector. Yeah. Thank you very much. The, the question, the, the Q&A question that's been upvoted the most, and I'm going to start by going straight to Sarah on this one, is from William Duncan, who's saying, if you really want to be a science superpower, 2.4% of GDP isn't much, is it? You've got to aim higher than that. What, would, you, would you like, should we suggest a higher target? Um, Sarah, I'm sure at Case you are, have been relentlessly pushing for more than 2.4. So what are your observations on William's challenge? Well, thank you, um, David. I, this relates to the last question, of course, and the, the quality and, and value of what you do with money. I, I think there is a, a, a tension here at the heart of what we're talking about in that, yeah, of course, 2.4% is a number that... Um, is, is outdated already. And, and yes, our, our ambition should not only be to continue that trajectory upwards, but for really importantly for that to be stable. Um, so we don't want to spend five or 10 years uh, reaching an, an economic goal only to see that decline in, in the following decade. We want it to be self-sustaining um, and, and growing. Um, but I, I think really it's really important that that investment is put to good use. And, and that the tension here that Graham was referring to earlier in the time frame of transformation is, is a really significant one that we, you know, when you pause and look at it, it sort of takes your breath away. When you when you look at the uh, that that figure, the GERD figure over the last um, two decades, possibly three decades, it's really, really very flat. And despite numerous interventions by um, governments of, of different political persuasion, it has been very hard to move that um, economic uh, metric. So I think the challenge ahead to move it even to 2.4% is, is, a, is a big one. And I think it would rep represent a transformational change and it would ultimately represent a transformation of the UK's economy and culture, uh, you know, change the world that we live in. So uh, yes, I'm all for that onward trajectory and, and for that stability, but we mustn't underestimate the scale of the challenge of reaching that first goal. Right. Thank you very much. As, as we've got so many questions coming in, I'm going to move straight on, if I may. Richard Parker has pointed out that he's got um, a lot of upvoting for his questions, which is about the EU's horizon framework. And uh, he's, he's interested in knowing how he doesn't think we can become a research superpower without full engagement within the with the EU and Horizon Europe, which, of course, is problematic. Now, it so happens that Graham uh, Reed has also been thinking about plan B options if we don't uh, associate. So what would your response be to Richard Parker's challenge, Graham? So I'd, I'd say that the position on Horizon clearly creates uh, forceful headwinds uh, in the superpower agenda. I, I don't think that any single uh, component part defines our potential to be a superpower. Uh, Horizon is a very well-liked part of the landscape, but don't let's imagine that there is no future without it. Clearly, we can choose to interpret the position we find ourselves in as an opportunity to place more emphasis on global collaboration. And we just have to be realistic about the, the political constraints on what the science community would like to do. Thanks. Martin, yes, do comment on that. Over to you. Yes. Um, well, I mean, I think um, uh, the perception is even worse, perhaps, than the reality. It's very important, obviously, that we should maintain 
these links with our nearest collaborators. It's a real loss. But of course, um, what does this do to the perception of a young, say, Indian or Singaporean scientist who wants to come to the West for experience? Uh, they would have in the past thought the UK was a, a good place, network with the US and with Europe. Now they'd be far more likely to want to go to Canada or Germany than the UK. And so we're losing uh, mobile talent. And I think it's very important to do this. And as a uh, comment on the earlier question, I would say we want to encourage the talent from China. I think China is going to be the world leader in many areas. We're going to lose out if we are too censorious about collaboration with China. So I think uh, we want to have wider links with them as well as uh, with, with Europe. Otherwise, we really are uh, going to be moving away from being a superpower rather than towards it. Thank you very much, Marcy. Lisa, I don't know if you want to intrude on private grief. Do you want to give us your take on what Brexit means for research collaboration and more widely? I mean, there's obviously for us, there's the US, there's Europe, and there's China. Any observations on all that? I, no, I think as, as far as Brexit goes, you know, we, we are your partners through thick and thin, and we are standing by. <laughs> We've certainly had our own headaches with Horizon 2020. I can't comment on um, the, I mean, I, I can only be empathetic since we, we <laughs> I was part of the negotiating team that enabled us to come back to the table. Our scientists, um, you know, there was a time when I believe MIT even put a banner up on their website and said, we can't, you know, if you're a scientist and you're doing something that requires Horizon 2020 involvement, then you have to step back. And, and then ultimately we, we solve that. But it, but it, the MITs might be able to, to say we can step back in the same way that the Oxfords can say, oh, no, we won't accept any Confucian money or something. But let's face it, there's lots of universities that need the Chinese students, and there's lots of universities that need to be able to participate with Horizon EU scientists. And, um, and so it is global. We need as many partners, and we need to maneuver and negotiate our way around the sensitivities so that we can work together. And just reminds what were America's issues with Horizon 2020? Because uh, not, now know, we're in the, in the boat. We're outsiders and, trying to get in. I have one of these minds that, that tends to forget when it's over, but um, especially when it's somewhat painful. But but it had to do with, um, for instance, for instance, where and and take this, you know, as a very vague memory, um, not for the record in any way, but. Uh, like if there was a dispute, where would the dispute be resolved? We we are not able to take something to the the Hague for resolution, um, and and there was just a lot of things that had a, a U.S. scientist had to sign. I don't remember what they were. There was a lot of signing away of your life into the EU documents that we just were not able to say. Um, you know that, that the U.S. scientists could not give away the kinds of um, rights that they have uh, to the to an EU decision maker so it was it was just negotiating those kinds of things yeah, David, if I could give a yeah. slightly different view to Graham's even though I'm sitting next to him I have <laughs> sometimes slightly different views on this um, I think it's important to state that the ambitions of uh, the Graham talked about being providing better provision for business and entrepreneurship or, or for or for other countries internationally, it's not mutually exclusive to being part of a European research collective. And I think we all understand that the um, regulatory and legal frameworks that underpin that multilateral collaboration um, are would take a great deal of time to recreate. And so at the very least, no, no matter which part of the spectrum you're on in your opinion, there is very likely to be a substantial transition phase which will require the UK to establish new bilateral and multilateral partnerships, legal and regulatory frameworks, all of which will have an impact on investment decisions of businesses and location decisions of scientists and researchers while that is ongoing. Um, and to link back to the timeliness point that was made in an earlier question, all of that if we do uh, not associated with Horizon Europe, that transition phase will take place during the time frame in which we are saying that we wish to rapidly transform our R&D economy. Um, so I think those two things, uh, you know, one makes the other certainly more challenging. 
Yes, thank you. Yes, um, thank you for making that point, uh, Sarah. Um, I want to. There's, there's a strand of questions which is which are really about how we get the most um, collaborate, how we get the most successful route to 2.4, and some of the tensions that linking public spend and private spend. One, one of the uh, questions is exactly what the what that means. Looking at Graham and Sarah for the for the three different options you identified. Um, there's also a question uh, in the Q&A about the extent to which government setting priorities on, for example, major challenges, constrain, it doesn't necessarily enable you to maximize business investment alongside. You might, uh, that might be a constraint. In some ways, um, um, a, a less prescriptive approach may maximize the opportunities for business R&D spend. And there are also worries that we've already touched on briefly just about the amount of bureaucracy getting in the way of a well-managed R&D system. So I'm gonna start with Graham and Sarah. Any observations about how public spend can most effectively leverage private spend in this shared target? I'm not hearing from, I think we may have briefly lost them. So I'm gonna go, I think, um, I feel like it's a day, it's a day program interviewer. I suddenly found the chance has gone off air. Uh, Martin, would you like to comment instead? <laughs> uh, yes, I would. I mean, uh, uh, let me say that um, uh, uh, obviously one handicap, presumably, is the the fact that the UK economy is so service based rather than manufacturing, and that that's obviously uh, uh, giving less incentive for. Uh, the obvious improvements in manufacturing which other countries will be developing um, but uh, um, let me just say that uh, uh, I, I feel that um, we should have more public expenditure if necessary um, in these long-term goals uh, like um, uh, um, clean energy uh, for uh, ourselves um, and also uh, as a potential way of uh, linking with the global south uh, with whom we collaborate and that they need it. So th that seems to be something which would be in our long-term interests. And even if that involves public expenditure now, I would have thought uh, we should do it. Um, because, um, uh, and the problem of course, um, as was alluded to, um, is to get the, uh, the politicians on side, which means getting the voters on side. Um, and uh, uh, getting the voters on side with something long-term uh, does, as, uh, as Lisa said, um, require, um, uh, the uh, get changing the public view and I, I like to say that uh, uh, things are better now uh, for long-term climate uh, research and policy uh, because of four disparate uh, uh, charismatic figures um, Pope Francis, um, David Attenborough, um, Bill Gates and Greta Thunberg. Those four people have changed public opinion in the UK and the US, and they've changed the rhetoric, if not the substance, of the business world as well. Uh, so that would make it more acceptable uh, to have a major program, uh, even if publicly funded initially, um, to really accelerate um, developments in some aspect of clean energy generation, uh, storage and transmission. And Martin, thank you. There's a dinner party to die for. Yes, thank you for that thought. Um, I'm sorry, we, we dropped yeah, we, out at the key moment. We, we yeah. were not ducking your question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Sarah or Graham, your comments? Um, so I'd, I, maybe I could start and then, but I'll not go on for too long. Um, I think that our scenarios really do interact on this point because there are many important areas of business investment in R&D where government has an important role as regulator or customer. And I point in particular to the security and defense domain, but also to pharmaceuticals. Um, so you can, it's not easy to separate them. The other observation I'd make is that in the UK, we have historically had high levels of foreign direct investment in business R&D, makes up more than half the total of business investment in R&D. But I'm not sure that we understand sufficiently the grounds on which we compete for such investment. We don't understand the component parts of success and how to optimize our performance in a competitive marketplace. Just yes. add to Martin's final comment there that I think you know, 
public support for this transformation is critical to the success of any or each of these scenarios um, and that at the case we're doing some work looking at that under a program called the discovery decade i think many other organizations are as well but this um this transformation agenda must include um interaction, exploration, and building support with different public audiences for a new version of the UK that will deliver benefits that they see as relevant to them. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sarah, uh, for that important point. Now, we're, we're, running, we're running out of time. And actually, I would like to suggest that finally we hear from Lisa, because it's wonderful to have you with us as a representative of the US view on these things. And I, I think we'd all be into any final observations, including on the extent to which this approach of setting targets for total R&D spend and then focusing and debating the balance of public and private, is that the kind of way the science funding debate is conducted in the US? How different does our debate look? Any final observations for us, Lisa? I, I think we, we do have a very different system because the way it works with us is, you know, with, with a lot of that research, the sort of elemental research from the 17 labs that you mentioned, um, then, then works its way into the private sector. In terms of business funding on R and D, it, it's you know the, the the products, the results are so nebulous and so hard to um, capture. And let's face it, all that business is it's all risk adverse, and so you do need public and government pressure because they they're not you know unless there's some payoff that they can quantify to their investors. Um, and I, I assume this is what you're referring to. I, I think it is it is difficult, and the public demand um, to do the right thing and uh, and the power of the marketplace, of course, will will have a major um, impact on that kind of research funding. Other than that, <laughs> it is interesting to, to hear these these. Uh, the birthing discussions of, of <laughs> but you know you're much much farther along I think than than you realize. Whenever I talk to scientists and research in the U.S., the the respect for U.K. science and research um, is is so high, and of, and of course everyone always says, and it's so much easier for them with the NHS to get all that data. <laughs> so you have certain advantages that we don't have, um, and. Some of us can only wish one day we will. So, well, that's a that's a thank you. That's a very um, sort of optimistic note on which to end. And thanks for those generous words, uh, Lisa. And thank you to all of our panelists: Graham Reed, Sarah Main, Lisa Brody, Martin Rees. Uh, I'm sorry we weren't able to get through all the Q and A, but it was we still covered a lot of ground. Um, a recording a, a recording of this event will be on our website tomorrow. If you've got any feedback for our email survey, that helps. And our next event will be next week, actually, on the 13th of July, when we are having an event on health policy implications of climate change with a range of speakers, including Chris Whitty, the Chief Medical Officer for England. Uh, and it's an online and in-person event and hope you'll be able to join us then. Meanwhile, thank you all very much for your participation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.